Yes, I think uh, you've summarized that very well, um, and you've even drawn James Clavell into it, which is uh, which is very clever. I, I, I enjoyed those books as well. China's maritime militia, which is really emblematic of China's entire maritime gray zone approach, in which they take this entity that essentially poses as fishermen, except for when it wants to do something security related. And some of the ships are do virtually nothing but security related activity. For many years, the Philippines tried, like other countries have tried, to uh, downplay incidents that happen in the maritime gray zone. Well, unlike a lot of other countries, the Philippines has this looming crisis approaching because tomorrow or the next day or in a, a month, the Sierra Madre could literally begin to break up. We don't know what the timetable is for the Sierra Madre, but whenever that happens, China it will pr pr uh, provoke a crisis, and China has the opportunity, because they have the preponderance of forces in the area, to essentially take over uh, Second Thomas Shoal on that occasion. Only the Philippines has a large uh, military base with port and airfield this being mischief reef within its own exclusive economic zone, only the Philippines has an active blockade against what should be considered the single most vulnerable outpost in the entire South China Sea. Welcome back to our channel. After our recent discussion of aerial intrusions into the Taiwanese ADIZ, today we are diving deep into the turbulent waters of the South China Sea. China versus the resilient Philippines, a nation that refuses to back down. The stage is set for one of the most intriguing battles of our time and the weapons. Not just missiles and warships, but a cunning tactic known as the Grey Zone. We'll dissect the recent violence perpetrated by the Chinese Coast Guard towards Filipino ships and the ongoing standoff at 2nd Thomas Shoal, where the Sierra Madre serves as a symbol of Filipino resolve. We'll unravel the chain of command, delving into the developments of 2021, where the Chinese Coast Guard fell under the purview of the military commission. We'll analyze the dangerous maneuvers of the Chinese Coast Guard and Honda. Whether internal factors like PLA purges and economic slowdowns could impact their actions in the South China Sea. Hi everyone, today we have a special guest, it's Ray Powell. He's a former U.S. Air Force Colonel, 20 years in service, then a U.S. attaché to Vietnam, Australia and Afghanistan, and also a director of Sea Light at the Gordian Knot Center for National Security Innovation at Stanford University. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, that's, that's the correct pronunciation, thanks. Okay, that, that's a long name. Okay, is this everything or I forgot something about... Um, about your, you know, uh, uh, I would I would just remark that uh, actually I ended up spending 35 years in the U.S. Air Force, so it was I, I'm, I'm a lot older than I look, I think. Okay, okay, okay. That's I said 20 because I heard it in another podcast. I think from South Africa they they mentioned 20. That, that's why I wanted to correct it. Okay, yeah, good. Now, my initial question would be: Where does your interest in this in this area come from? For which you are now quite famous, you know, uh, f following following the gray zone tactics in the South China Sea. Where where is the interest from? Well, as you mentioned, I spent quite a long time in the United States Air Force, and my, my very first jobs involved the South China Sea. Uh, really, from the Vietnamese perspective, I was what was called then a Vietnamese crypto linguist, and that was during a time that we were not in uh, normal relationships with a uh, normal relationship with Vietnam like we have now, but we were actually in, in a pretty antagonistic one. It wasn't just that we had recently fought a war, but also that they were still in what was the old Soviet bloc. And uh, the Soviet Union was flying bombers out of uh, Vietnamese airfields at Cam Ranh Bay. So we had a lot of uh, intelligence interest in Vietnam. And so I was uh, sort of pulled into the South China Sea disputes by my uh, job that, that required me to know a lot about that circumstance. So that, uh, that's sort of what it got started. Um, and over the years, uh, some of the assignments that you mentioned have continuously brought me back to the South China Sea as an area of 
great interest to the U.S. national security, but also the security of, of, of a very, very important region. And what exactly is CELITE, the organization you are now heading? That's a really interesting story. So I'm going to take a step even further back and explain what the Gordian Knot Center is. So you mentioned the Gordian okay. Knot Center for, the, for National Security Innovation is a center at Stanford University that, that uses entrepreneurial methods to look at national security problems. <clears throat> so as a 35-year veteran of the, uh, uh, the bureaucracy surrounding national security in the United States, I, am, I can tell you very confidently that we don't do a great job of innovating all the time because bureaucracies just don't do that naturally. So uh, uh, the Gordian Knot Center brings in mostly students and gives them real world national security problems to look into. Now, I was not a student. I was a fellow uh, at uh, the Distinguished Careers Institute at Stanford when I approached the Gordian Knot Center with a, a proposal to look into South China Sea issues. And that was only about a year ago. And so they, uh, great, they were, uh, thankfully, they accepted my proposal and a number of other students and former students and just interested people in the, in the, in the field asked to take part. And we began a series of over 100 interviews of people in and around the South China Sea security problem. And through that entrepreneurial process, we eventually decided to focus in on the information domain, which is where uh, a big a big part of where the gray zone, uh, what we call the gray zone problem resides. And the gray zone security problem in the South China Sea is that there are activities that happen there that are um, easy to hide or make deniable or opaque simply because people can't see them. And so we thought if we could have something like sea light, right, like a light that we could shine into that dark place uh, using commercially available technology, that would bring a lot more attention to these gray zone activities, bring them out into the light so that the people who commit the acts or the, the countries that commit the acts can be accountable for them. So that was where it all started. And uh, it's really it's only been in, in an active uh kind of in the space where we've been able to put out a lot of the information for about uh, for this this calendar year 2023 and it's been a very exciting year one little question i'm just curious are those interviews you mentioned somewhere available like what happened to them oh those are all off the record we don't uh, oh. we don't release those we want the we want our interviewees to uh speak very very candidly to us and so we, boy, I will tell you, we got a lot of very interesting responses. Yeah, that's and what we've I inter think. interviewed yeah. people who are in violent disagreement with one another at times. Uh, and yeah. that's actually a good thing and uh, yes. helped us to refine our, our, our process very much. Yeah, I was curious because I can imagine there is a lot of interesting stuff. So it's all for internal use, yes? Yeah, yes. Okay, good. I'm sad to hear that. Okay. I wanted to ask you, because, you know, here in Taiwan, we've been for decades on the receiving end of the Chinese benevolence. You know, the, the CCP likes to portray itself as a, you know, benevolent, peaceful country, and a lot of people buy into it. So I think your organization does a great job on shedding light, light on it. Um, recently, it's been also the Philippines. Maybe we could talk a little bit about this topic that I think you, you're calling in the media the Beijing's Little Blue Man. So what's going on there? It's been so much in the in the news the last recent weeks. What's going on um, uh, with the, with the Philippines? Why are they now on the receiving end? Well, to be uh, to be fair, I, the little blue men comment was uh, didn't come from from me. I think it was in a uh, in an article that that I was quoted in. Uh -huh. um, but it, it comes from essentially. So the little blue men idea. Uh, obviously is a reflection yes. of the little green men that yes. uh, invaded, uh, quietly invaded Ukraine yes. back, or Crimea back in 2014. Um, but it's, it's, it's a, a reference to China's maritime militia, which is really emblematic of China's entire maritime gray zone approach, in which they take this entity that essentially poses as 
fisherman except for when it wants to do something security related. And some of the ships are do virtually nothing but security related activities. Some of them may actually fish from time to time. And it just depends on what their, their remit is. And it depends on, uh, and, and China's national approach to how they talk about them or how they treat them depends on the circumstance. And that is a perfect uh, example of how China uses the opacity, the, uh, the confusion uh, of the gray zone to their advantage. Whereas in the West, we generally will say, no, no, we make a very strict separation between the civilian activities and military activities. China has figured out that they can gain great advantage by blurring all of those lines. So if, for example, a Chinese maritime militia ship is involved in an incident in which another ship is, say, rammed or harassed or whatever, China can sort of take a step back and say, it was just a fisherman. Uh, we, we will uh, we will look into it. We'll, 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 we take your concern seriously. And it seems to be, you know, we, we will take a look at that. But they don't have to uh, directly uh, ad admit that it, as a national, uh, as a matter of national policy, they are employing these militia ships to enforce their maritime claims. And it works because the regular people, like you know, observers, just people who listen to the news in the West, for them it's okay. Yeah, they buy they buy into it. So I think it's a very smart and idea that actually works. It it, it certainly works for an authoritarian state like China, which doesn't have the civil military uh, concerns that we would have in a free society. So uh, right now, of course, the Philippines is trying to figure out if there is a counter to the militia strategy along the same lines, right? Could we take naval reservists and use them in a sort of quasi-militia way? And that's a hard question because uh, our societies, our values don't allow us to do the kinds of things that China does with militia uh, because they don't have the concerns about the, the division between civilian and military uh, activities. Dear viewers, help us overcome algorithm suppression by liking, commenting, and sharing this important content, especially since we talk to world's top experts. Now, the name that came up recently so often is the Sierra Madre on the second Thomas show in the Spratly Islands, and especially the, uh, you know, the, the videos that we've seen with the recent uh, violent violation, the Chinese Coast Guard ship fired water cannon on a smaller fin Philippine counterpart. Could you please elaborate a little bit about that? And does it really make a, any significance? Like, did this change anything in China's perception or, or what's going on here? So it, this is an area where it's really important to take a big step back and see the whole picture. Uh, so back in the 90s, China uh, laid claim to Mischief Reef, which was at the time a low tide elevation. In other words, uh, it was a place that was not actually even an island or even under uh, the international definitions, a rock. It was at it was in other words, it was below uh, high tide levels. Um, so they, they, but they managed to put some structures out on Mischief Reef, and when the Philippines discovered them, because this was very close to their own uh, shores, within about 100 nautical miles, uh, they quickly responded, not just diplomatically, but they took an old World, World War II ship, the Sierra Madre, and ran it aground on the nearby shoal called Second Thomas, or they call it Ayungan. So. Um, Second Thomas Shoal became a Philippine outpost aboard this ship. Well, the problem is, of course, is that a ship sitting in the middle of the sea, not receiving any regular maintenance, over time begins to rust away. And that's what's happened to the Sierra Madre over the past quarter century. So China has taken the tack of simply blockading the ship. And this is one of those things where we have not sufficiently absorbed, I think, in the West or even in the perhaps in the Philippines, the fact that there is an active blockade of a Philippine outpost within its own exclusive economic zone being carried out by a hostile power. And so China has been blockading the resupply missions and the only vessels they will allow through the blockade are very small ships 
uh, wooden ships that can carry food and replacement troops. So this is a really serious situation. And China is doing this because their strategy is eventually the uh, Sierra Madre will break up. It will not be, be habitable forever as long as the Philippines is unable to repair it or replace it. So that's what the point of the blockade is. So these various um, incidents we've seen throughout the year, from the laser pointing incident back in February to a couple of blockading, uh, blocking uh, uh, incidents we've seen, and now this most recent water cannoning incident, are all related to the blockade of the Sierra Madre. And so understanding this as a blockade and the Philippines' response, which this year has been very different from in past years, where they have actively put out the pictures and the video of these encounters so that the, the Philippine people and the world can come to terms with them, has been a, a, a radical departure from past practice. You know, for many years, the Philippines tried, like other countries have tried, to uh, downplay incidents that happen in the maritime gray zone. Well, unlike a lot of other countries, the Philippines has this looming crisis approaching because tomorrow or the next day or in a, a month, the Sierra Madre could literally begin to break up. We don't know what the timetable is for the Sierra Madre, but whenever that happens, China, it will pr pr uh, provoke a crisis and China has the opportunity, because they have the preponderance of forces in the area, to essentially take over uh, Second Thomas Shoal on that occasion. So you mentioned they're highlighting and showing uh, those pictures, making this more public. But does it have any effect? Does it somehow work to their advantage? Yeah, the great zone tactics are becoming more you know, publicized, and there's organizations like yours, there is a Filipino government with a new approach. Does it work? Is there, do you know, is there maybe the U.S. government and the Filipino government somehow talking to each other? Are there any preparations in, in this matter? Well, you can look at some of the evidence, right? So some of the evidence is that the Philippines has received at least expressions of support from the international community, has, re uh, has received reaffirmations of the applicability of the mutual defense treaty between the U.S. and the Philippines, so that U.S. officials at very high levels have come out and said, any attack on any Philippine outpost in the, in the uh, South China Sea uh, would invoke the treaty. They've uh, received promises uh, from, and it looks like active planning now from the United States to begin conducting joint patrols. There has okay. been renewed discussion in the Philippine body politic about how they're resourcing the uh, maritime forces of the Philippines. And, you know, I'm just reading this morning discussions about the, the, how they're resourcing the Coast Guard in their next budget. So these are all part of doing what you know, we, we call building resilience, right? You cannot, you cannot in, particularly in democratic societies, you can't address these problems until you have the support of the people. And certainly the Philippines has built a lot of support among the Filipino people for pushing back against this very looming threat, which is, again, very unique in the South China Sea. Um, no other country, even though we have many claimants and everyone has their own issues with China's nine dash line uh, claims that push all the way into other, you know, five other countries' exclusive economic zones. Only the Philippines has a large uh, military base with port and airfield, this being mischief reef within its own exclusive economic zone. Only the Philippines has an active blockade against what should be considered the single most vulnerable outpost in the entire South China Sea, that being at Second Thomas Shoal. If you believe in me, please like it, leave a comment and share the show with friends. It might not look like it, but I have quite a lot of expenses. I am not asking for money, only for support. The goal of this program is to spread the knowledge. Now, we know that in 2021, the China Coast Guard came under the jurisdiction of the Chinese Central Military Commission effectively making it part of Beijing's military. Wouldn't there be a way to, to prove the chain of command and maybe then prove it's not just you no know, fishermen, it's just not just a militia, it's not just a Coast Guard, it's all a part of a huge you know, military, military system? 
wouldn't this make it a bit easier for the West to react and maybe justify some of their actions if they come? I think that's very well put. Um, and uh, China's Coast Guard law is not secret. Uh, and so understanding its role in the, uh, the, the military structure, which is, again, different from uh, other countries, um, in the in the United States, we have uh, a Coast Guard which can fulfill military functions in times of war, but we try to keep that separation during uh, w when we're not at war. Uh, and so there are very strict laws in the United States keeping those two things separate. Um, in the in China, those things have been fused. We we often refer to it as civil military fusion, and the maritime militia is also properly understood in this sense. The difficulty with the militia is, of course, China's opacity with regard, whereas China Coast Guard at least writes China Coast Guard in extremely large letters on the sides of its ships. No, uh, China never refers to an individual ship as a militia ship. It might admit that it has a maritime militia, but it's extremely coy about which ones are in the militia. And so we have, you know, we and others have come up with lists the, of the ones that act like militia ships, but each of those in in in, in sort of individual cases, you know, the Chinese uh, spokespeople and and their and their uh, mouthpieces will say, "Well, how do you know that's a militia ship? It's a you know, it's got fishing nets, so how do you know?" Um, and even though uh, they they have very little credibility in the West, it's enough of a veneer so that it just keeps the issue confused just enough so that there's not necessarily a great response. There is also another very unique Chinese tactic. They, they have, you know, those hotlines set up with the US, with the Philippines, other countries, but they just don't pick up the phones. So that's a very common practice. It, it, it's been already going on in um, 2001 during the Hainan crisis with the, with the US um, aircraft shot over uh, or pushed down over Hainan. And interestingly, it, it seems really a common practice because even when I read the trilogy by James Clavell about Hong Kong, and there was the Taipan was negotiating with the, with the Communist Party, even then they didn't pick up phones. The, the, the Taipan was waiting for a decision. And even in the literature, you can see that's a very common practice. Now they use it now internationally, globally. Uh, I think this, this hasn't been even done by the Soviets. They kind of were more responsive. So that's something very unique that, again, Chinese, I think, are using as a bargaining chip towards the West because they understand it in a different way and they know that's one more argument they have to use. Yes, I think uh, you've summarized that very well, um, and you've even drawn James Clavell into it, which is uh, which is very clever. I, I, I enjoyed those books as well. Yeah. Um, so the, I think that the way to think about the difference from the Soviet approach is the Soviet Union seemed to understand that with two nuclear-armed uh, opponents looking at one another, that the risks of escalation were potentially catastrophic. So there needed to be a way to communicate with one another during crisis situations that would avert the ultimate fear of both sides, which was a nuclear exchange. China seems less worried about this, and so is free to view the, uh, the crisis hotlines as, it, as, as you say, a bargaining chip, something that you want more than they do, therefore it's of use to them. So, for example, in this circumstance, I would say a couple of things about the hotline that the Chinese did not pick up. First, this was not a crisis for China. This was an operation. China had planned it. It had prepositioned its forces. There were, by my count, 32 militia ships, six Coast Guard, and four Navy ships awaiting the resupply mission. That is not a normal-sized uh, contingent in and around that area. It was clearly a show of force. And it was clearly intended to send the message that China believes it has escalation dominance in that area and that the Philippines should back off. So China planned for this, this event. It was not a crisis for them. And so to have the Philippines trying to reach them on the crisis hotline and ignoring their calls, it was one more part of the, of the bigger picture power play that uh, for China was the, the point of the entire exercise. Okay, I, I, there, I really love to have military personnel on my show because I, I've, I've had quite a few. I guess you know some of them uh, probably also privately. But I've asked 
some of them the same question and actually no one could give me an answer that I, that would actually satisfy my my curiosity all those you know when, when whenever there is a laser being directed at the, at the aircraft or a ship uh, be it in Djibouti, be it in the South China Sea, or, you know, flares in front of an Australian plane. Like, why does no one shoot back? Why does always Japan give in, Australia give in, the US? Like, it's like, like, what do we have a military for, if force, if not for, yeah, let's say sometimes shooting back. I also spoke here to a Taiwanese F-16 pilot, and he said whenever they're being targeted by the by the uh, PLA Air Force, and they ask, hey, could I at least target him back? Always the, 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 the supervisor say, hey, go home, go back, 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 back to the base. So no one literally challenges uh, the Chinese. Well, so of course, you know, to begin with, when we talk about something like a laser or a water cannon, we refer to these in our own parlance as non-lethal weapons, right? And honestly, these are, when they are used as weapons, we generally think them, of them as being used for crowd control. So, if, if, for example, if a police force is facing down a, an, a, an unruly mob and trying to gain control of a situation. So the use of them in a quasi-military sense is something that we've never really normalized around. And we certainly haven't planned for, right? So uh, the rules of engagement that various militaries, whether they be US, Australian, or the Philippines, or whoever, can be very cloudy, right? And so everyone on our side, if you will, of this, of this discussion is concerned about escalation. Whereas for China, in many cases, escalation is the entire point. So yes. what I guess what th this is saying is we have an asymmetry at work that we haven't entirely internalized and figured out how to respond to in a way that, that would actually advance our interests. So um, I think that this is probably something that we're going to be doing a lot more study on. Again, I, I'm not in those circles. I am now out of government. But that is one reason that we at the Gordian Knot Center and at Sea Light have been developing this gray zone playbook that we've been rolling out every uh, week or you know, once or twice a week, different chapters on so that we can start talking about the use of lasers, the use of water cannons, the use of blocking, you know, all of these things that, that China uses as part of its own playbook. In fact, it's actually published documents that, d that detail how some of these uh, tactics are to be used by their own Coast Guard. Uh, and we need to be able to uh, have an open and honest discussion about what our own tactics should be in order to respond to them so that, as you say, we don't just sit back and take, take it, but we don't necessarily want to respond, say, with lethal force against the use of a non-lethal weapon. Uh, my impression is, I have to be honest, I, it looks to me like a, you dodged a little bit the answer because you mentioned those, you know, easy ones like water cannons and stuff, but I think they're pronounced shafts or chaffs in front of the Australian aircraft. Right. That, that, was, that was dangerous. You had also recently uh, uh, Chinese aircraft uh, crossing, you know, uh, very close to the U.S. aircraft. I mean, that's not water cannon. That's really dangerous stuff. It is. And um, in those cases, what we tend to refer to those things, again, in our own parlance is dangerous maneuvers. And so, again, we don't necessarily, th those are other types of gray zone actions that because they are not overtly lethal, although they can certainly turn lethal. And in fact, in 2001, as you, as you mentioned, uh, the incident turned lethal for the Chinese pilot uh, that was involved in that incident with the uh, EP-3 uh, near Hainan Island, and which also, of course, sp sparked a pretty major international incident. But I think your point is well taken that because we have over the years not had an effective response to these things, it's caused, the, it's caused us to normalize around them and say, okay, well, sometimes China does these things and we will file very strong diplomatic protests, but it hasn't really given us a way to respond militarily in a, in a way that is both reasonable, sensible, but also does not simply kind of appear to roll over and take it. Good, I still have two questions. One, I'm not sure it's within your interest, but the recent economic slowdown, and you know that the purges in the, in the, um, 
uh, the missile force recently and, and mm -hmm. the missile force and the economic slowdown and the purges. Do you think it gives us some hope that maybe, I don't know, in a year or two that the PLA would have to slow down because either they don't have the budget or it's too chaotic or there is too much reshuffle? Do you think it could affect, uh, you know, their, their, ar their armament, the constant progress and improvement and the West kind of only catching up with them? Well, I think it goes to the very heart of the question and why we're uh, engaged in exposing their gray zone actions is because China has problems, right? It is not just uh, a rusty ship on a shoal of in, uh, you know, far away in the South China Sea. It is not just these, these, in, these single incidents. At some point, China is going to have to focus on the, problem, on the most pressing problems. And so the question is, as we raise the reputational cost, as we raise the international cost on China for what it does in these incidents in the Philippines uh, or Vietnam or Malaysia's exclusive economic zones, for example, is there a time when China says, look, we've got other things to worry about. We don't have to pick every fight with everybody all the time over everything. And maybe it is in our national interest to prioritize and to tell our military commanders or our wolf warrior diplomats calm down, uh, stop making more problems than we are prepared to handle. And I think that that comes back to the question of what deters China. Right now, China has seemed in many ways to be almost undeterrable, right? Every, every response uh, seems to bring an escalation because China has confidence, uh, maybe, uh, un well, almost certainly unhealthy, maybe extreme confidence that it will eventually win every confrontation. So a refocusing of China on saying, for example, uh, uh, with respect to the economy, look, we need to, uh, you know, we are, our economic situation is not getting better uh, in the, the, all of the decoupling or de-risking or whatever we're going to call it is causing us more economic problems. If we're going to get back to sort of some level of, of uh, economic progress, we're going to have to figure out how to interact with the rest of the world. We can't just uh, retreat into fortress China and hope that this is going to get better. In that, I think that's what we're all working for is, you know, in the expectation that all of these other problems that have been creeping up on China and have been sort of bursting into the open, especially since COVID, uh, will eventually cause a recalculation where China's leadership because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take its leadership to, to, to communicate to its international affairs people, to its military uh, and Coast Guard and maritime militia that it doesn't want to have so many confrontations all at the same time. Good. My last question is, uh, would you like to discuss something that maybe you're now working on or researching, something that might be relevant in the near future that you kind of foresee maybe happening or is within your interest? Well, I guess I would just you know bring up the, the you've mentioned Sea Light and we, we have our, our the website that we launched a month ago Sea Light Live, which we are building out into what we hope will become a destination for people who are interested in these questions of maritime gray zone operations. As of currently, we are very focused on the South China Sea. We expect the, the, that uh, that interest will sort of grow and expand, but. You know, we've been very focused mostly on documenting incidents and uh, explaining them in the context of China's gray zone playbook. So we we want and invite people to go to sealight.live and look at what we've compiled, whether it be for researchers. We have videos for for, for novices who are just trying to understand the the issues. We have we we uh, are, are, are have created a little bit of a portal so that people can know where to find various kinds of resources. And we want your feedback. So if you go there and you say, why, have, why haven't you mentioned such and such a document or such and such a site that we think is, is really uh, useful, well, send that to us. It, we, you'll, you'll see our email at the bottom of the page on the, on the about page. You can send that to us. And uh, we are, you know, we've only been out there for a month. So we're actively collecting uh, information so that uh, we can provide a better focus for people who are interested in digging into this issue because we think it's a really important one and one that is going to become maybe uh, uh, sort of existentially important should things really come to a head in the South China Sea. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm following you on Twitter and LinkedIn. So now we have another source. I will put it in the description. Ray, thank you very much. It was really fascinating. Very interesting interview. Well, you've, you've been a, a great host and I thank you for having me. Thank you very much.